Probably one of the most famous people associated with the Hollow Earth theory is Vice Admiral Richard Byrd of the US Navy who managed to see the underworld with his own eyes and recorded everything in detail in his secret diary. What sets his story apart from others is the fact that his son published his personal diary after his death. He was a distinguished pioneer aviator and polar explorer who flew over the North Pole on May 9th. 1926 and led numerous expeditions to Antarctica, including a flight over the South Pole on November 29, 1929. What did he see there? The anomalies he witnessed, UFOs surrounded him, and even more scandalous, he literally met with their leader or the master of the underground civilization, as he calls him. What exactly did he discover in his numerous expeditions to the poles, and how did an admiral of such a high rank dare to expose secrets like these? We'll find out together in the new episode of Secret Origins. Welcome. Before we jump to conclusions, it is important to understand what kind of man Admiral Byrd was. Richard Byrd is one of the most respected officers in history. Naval officer, aviator, explorer, first person to fly to the North and South Poles, recognized by everyone with the Medal of Honor, the highest military award in the United States. He was a true leader and kept detailed records of each of his journeys in his journal. He was neither a poet, nor an author, nor a storyteller, but a soldier. The idea that someone of this ranks starts making up stories is unacceptable. According to the notes and stories of his colleagues, he lived honorably. He was aware of the responsibility for his words and choices regarding the lives of those who depended on him and of course the country he served. When he returned from his travels, he was interviewed live on television in 1954. What he says is quite mysterious, strange and confusing to some extent. He says something like, I want to see the country beyond the pole. He doesn't say to the pole, but beyond. He calls it the land of eternal mystery, the most peaceful place on the planet. A huge amount of territory that is not on any of the maps as big as the USA, but hidden from people. And one more thing, the most valuable and important place on the planet for science. After his consecutive expedition in 1947, he says, this is the most important expedition in the history of mankind. And what he repeats the most is, this is the center of the great unknown. All this sounds extremely strange considering that there are no such visible places on the planet. If we're talking about Antarctica and the ice to call it a peaceful place with real peace, that is quite strange, military officer. As one of the highest ranking men in the military, he was of course sworn to keep many secrets. Maybe that's the reason for his weird way of expression. In February 1947, Bird said, I want to see the land beyond the pole, the center of the great unknown. Millions of people hear it on the radio and read it in the newspapers. But what is he talking about? If we look at the map, everything known is at most 320 kilometers away. And he said, even after 2,700 kilometers, they had not reached the end of this earth. He should have seen nothing but an ocean covered with ice, but instead he flew over whole kilometers full of green nature, mountains, lakes. It was published that he discovered two unknown zones with a distance of over 6,400 kilometers, but his story mysteriously disappears. Why is everything he talked about suddenly being suppressed? Praised as the world's greatest explorer, Admiral Byrd mentions that the new land has created great interest. After that, these statements disappeared instantly. Comments on his discoveries, all the news as well as photos that Byrd showed soon disappeared from the public eye. Did Byrd really discover a new land? A discovery that could provide new information about the creation and development of our planet? 
Burr was trying to say what he knew. It is clear that he knew something, but he tried to say it not quite clearly and directly. To add a little more to this mysterious case, in 1956, Flying Saucer magazine editor Ray Palmer wrote a detailed story about the Admiral's discoveries. Interestingly, just before it was published, almost all the copies disappear and the few that are found are in poor condition, to say the least. About 20 years before the Operation High Jump, Richard Bird attempted a flight over the North Pole. On 9th of May 1926, the famous American explorer took off from the Norwegian Arctic island of Svalbard with his pilot Floyd Bennett in an attempt to be the first to fly to the North Pole. About four hours later, the pair returned to the island in their Fokker Josephine Ford engine plane, claiming that they had indeed accomplished the attempt. Bird turned over his navigational records to the US Navy and a committee of the National Geographic Society, one of his sponsors, which confirmed the achievement according to the Ohio State University libraries. Bird was hailed as hero, receiving the Medal of Honor and went on to fly over to the South Pole as well as achieve many other milestones in polar exploration. But from 1926 on, not everyone thought Bird and Bennett had actually reached the North Pole. The argument rested on whether the plane could have covered the distance in just 15 hours and 44 minutes as them noted that the flight was expected to take about 18 hours, given the plane's ground speed. Numerous people have waded in on the debate over the past 90 years, some accusing Bird of fraud and others coming to support, all using different evidence, including Bird's own records of the day. Bird was accused of lying about being the first to fly over the North Pole. Even with his research casting doubt on Bird, Newsom, a professor of astronomy at Ohio State, still expresses respect for Bird's pioneering journey which was made at a time when airplane navigation was much more difficult and dangerous, especially over the barren Arctic in an overfueled plane, intensely loud cockpit and frostbite concerns. That they came back at all is a great achievement, and the fact that they got where they were supposed to go, it shows that Bert knew how to navigate properly with his sun compass, Newsom says. But for Navy Admiral Byrd to lie about the expedition, about the people with him, about what he saw, about his entire diary, which we will look at it in a moment with detailed events by dates and times, this does not seem like an unusual act of a man of his status. Another thing he shared is that the poles are concave, not convex as they thought. It was documented that there was a large spike in temperature as they approached the pole, but one of Bird's greatest mysteries may have occurred just after the end of World War II. On February 1, 1947, the expedition called High Jump, scheduled for eight months of work, arrived in Antarctica in the area of Queen Maud Land. Rear Admiral Byrd's expedition was considered strictly scientific, but it was funded by the US Navy. They went to Antarctica accompanied by the aircraft carrier Casablanca with 25 planes and 7 helicopters on board, a submarine, an icebreaker and 12 tankers on which there were 4,800 people. At that time, the official statement was that the expedition's main mission was to find coal and other resources. The story was later changed to military hands-on training, preparation and establishment of an intelligence base. Meanwhile, we can't help but wonder why did they need 32 planes, 13 ships and nearly 5,000 people, many of whom die afterwards. It is later learned that the real purpose of the mission was to retrieve the missing Nazi leaders from their base in Antarctica. Large-scale work on aerial photography was carried out, a polar station was equipped, but then many strange messages appeared on the air. They are attacking us, we are suffering heavy losses. It is known who Rear Admiral Byrd was at war with, but on March 3rd, 1947, all work was suddenly stopped and the expedition hurriedly returned to America. 
The materials from the expedition were immediately classified and nothing was reported about the reasons for the Admiral's escape from Antarctica. Secretary of the Navy James Forrestal began to speak. President Truman forced him to resign and he was soon sent to a mental institution where he was confined to a windowless room and forbidden to speak to or see anyone, including his own wife. After some time, this very high-ranking man was found dead and the case was ruled a suicide. If there was nothing, why would you be locked up in a clinic where you are forbidden to talk to anyone? Bird spoke to a reporter for the Chilean newspaper El Mercurio, saying he didn't want to scare anyone but was adamant that if there was another war, the US would be attacked by flying objects that could fly from pole to pole at incredible speed. This is where this journal comes in. Shortly after Bird's death, his son published a diary under the title The Missing Diary of Admiral Richard Bird, revealing a completely different point of view than the official information. But do we actually have a proof that the Earth is hollow and many civilizations live there? The diary begins like this. I am writing this diary in secret and I do not fully understand everything. It refers to my Arctic flight on February 19, 1947. There comes a time when the inevitability of the truth overshadows rationality. I am not allowed to disclose the following documentation at the time of writing. It will never be released to the general public, but it is my duty to write everything so that it will be read one day. In a world of greed and exploitation, surely humanity will no longer be able to suppress the truth. This confirms his honorable character and that perhaps he was indeed sworn to secrecy. 9 past 10 in the morning. Both magnetic and gyro compasses begin to spin and wobble, unable to maintain course by instruments. We're taking a sun compass, but everything looks good. The steering seems to be lagging and responding sluggishly, but no indication of freezing. 9.15. Something like mountains can be seen in the distance. 9.49. 29 minutes elapsed time since the first sighting of the mountains, it is no illusion. They are mountains and they consist of a small chain, the like of which I have never seen before. 10 am. We pass over the small mountain range and continue north as far as it can be determined. Behind the mountain range is a sort of a valley with creek or stream running through the central part. There shouldn't be a green valley below. Something is definitely wrong and unusual here. We must be above ice and snow. On the left side of the board, there are large forests growing on the slopes of the mountain. Our navigation instruments are still spinning. The gyroscope is swinging back and forth. 10.05 AM. I change altitude to 1,400 feet and make a sharp left turn to explore more of the valley below. It is green from either moss or a type of thick grass. The light looks different here. I can't see the sun anymore. We make another left turn and spot something like a large animal below us. It's like an elephant. No, looks more like a mammoth. This is amazing, but here it is. I drop to 1,000 feet and grab the binoculars to study the animal better. It's confirmed, it's definitely a mammoth-like animal. I am reporting this to base camp. The shock continues with the temperature go showing 23 degrees Celsius. He is trying to connect to the base camp but the devices are not working. Suddenly, he realizes that flying saucers are coming around him. 10.30 more rolling green hills below. The outside temperature reads 23 degrees Celsius. We continue on our course. Navigation tools now look normal. I cannot explain their actions. I'm trying to contact base camp. The radio doesn't work. 1130. 
The surroundings below us are flatter and normal, if I may use that word. Ahead we see something like a city. It is impossible. The plane seems to be light and strangely floating. The plane cannot be controlled by us, God. To the left and the right of the wings there are some strange planes. They are approaching quickly from the side. They are disc shape and glow. They are now close enough to see their markings. It's a type of swastika. This is fantastic. Where are we? What happened? I pull the steering wheel again. Does not respond. We are caught in some invisible grip. 11.35 The radio transmits and a voice is heard in English with what appears to be a slight Nordic or German accent. Welcome Admiral to our domain. We'll land you in exactly 7 minutes. Relax, Admiral, you are in good hands. I notice that our plane engines have stopped working. The plane is under some strange control and is now turning on its own. 11.40 Another radio message received. We are already starting the landing process and for a few moments the plane shudders slightly and starts to descend as if it's caught in some huge invisible elevator. The downward movement is neglectable and we land with a very slight bounce. 11.45 I make a quick last entry in the logbook. Several men are approaching our plane on foot. They are tall with blonde hair. In the distance there is a large glittering city pulsing with rainbow hues of color. I don't know what will happen now, but I don't see any sign of weapons on the approaching ones. Now I hear a voice commanding me by name to open the cargo door. I obey. End of the logbook by Richard Bird. From here on, I write all subsequent events from my memory. It's beyond imagination and would seem like utter madness if it hadn't happened. There, Burr was welcomed to the place which the residents used to call it, guess how? They called it Agartha. After exiting the plane, they were put on a vehicle without wheels and driven at high speed to a glowing city that looked as if it was made of crystal. They were given some strange drink, after which Bird was led through many corridors with glowing walls to a huge hall where he met the ruler of Agartha, the master. He told Bird that he had been admitted to Agartha because the admiral had a noble character. He told him that they were in the country of the Aryans in Inner Land. He assured him that they would not interfere with their mission on the surface and that after their meeting he would be brought back safely to the surface. The reason they wanted to meet with him was related to the concern caused by the use of atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He warned him that the path of our civilization had taken lead to a great destruction in time as well as they who live in Agartha will be there and will help the people who survive. And Bert's task was to convey the master's message to the people on the surface. After the conversation with the master, Bert is taken to his plane. Esoteric Jewel Cool says that based on his channeling, he was able to confirm that Admiral Bird did indeed travel to the inner earth as he said. He said there is a sun in the inner earth but it's different from ours. He said that Aurora Borealis is not caused by the inner earth sun but by a different light source. He said that openings of the poles are very wide and ships and aircraft can enter them. However, they are naturally shielded by some kind of energy field. People can find them if they really look for them, however, they are slightly masked by this energy field. He confirmed that their entrances to the inner earth in Egypt, Tibet, Yucatan and also added that there are other entrances in the Bermuda Triangle, Russia and Africa. He said that there are different races in the inner earth, just like on the surface of the earth and some of them are quite tall. It also confirmed that the US government and other countries were aware of inner earth but were covering up the facts and that they were communicating with UFOs and extraterrestrials. 
A year after the end of the expedition, reports began to appear in the press that it did not return in full. One ship was lost, 13 aircrafts were damaged and about 68 people were killed, and the new aircraft carried was urgently sent for repairs. Reports appeared in the press that Rear Admiral Byrd in April 1947 gave detailed explanation at a secret meeting of the Presidential Commission in Washington. Various versions have been given in the press about this strange war, including that the Rear Admiral fought with the forces of the Fort Reich or with New Schwabia, based in the hollows of Antarctica, and the flying saucers were secret developments of the Nazis. In the summary of the commission, there were such passages. The ship and the aircraft of the 4th US Arctic Expedition were attacked by strange flying saucers, which came out from under the ground and moved at great speed, inflicted considerable damage on the expedition. Admiral Byrd was imprisoned in a psychiatric hospital for five years, but interestingly, when the Fuhrer died down, he came out of psychiatry and calmly returned to a commanding post in the US Navy, probably the government didn't think he was crazy at all. Ten years later, he writes his last message in his diary and message to us all. The last few years after 1947 were not easy, now I want to make my last entry in the this journal. In conclusion, I want to say that I have faithfully kept this secret all these years. It was about my desires and my values. Now I feel that my days are numbered, but this secret will not go with me to the grave. But like any truth, sooner or later it will triumph. This may be the only hope for humanity. I saw the truth and it strengthened my spirit and set me free. I pay tribute to the monstrous machine of the military industrial complex. As soon as the long arctic night is over, the dazzling diamond of truth will shine forth and those in darkness will be drowned in its light. For I saw the earth beyond the pole, is that the center of the great unknown? Bird's story is also confirmed by a leaked tape from Russian military intelligence. The footage was taken from the Meyer station and shows a giant hole in Antarctica, just as Bird described it. The story of Admiral Byrd is an extraordinary story of an extraordinary man. Did his son publish an entire diary to undermine the authority of the prestigious naval officer he loved so much as his father? Or did the war admiral write all this to make fun of his principles and his legacy? Is this true? Is it a hidden reality? And have we been lied to all this time? Please do tell us in the comments down below. Do you think that the earth is hollow and inner civilizations exist? We can be only certain for one thing. If we keep on searching, if we keep on looking, one day, no matter how long it takes, we will find out the truth. We bow before you and thank you for watching another episode of Secret Origins. Until we meet again.